before we made these changes, what my patients were going through and what I was telling my patients. You know, I'd go in a room on a post-op day board and my patient would be writhing in pain. And I would say, don't worry, tomorrow it's going to be 50% better. Today just kind of sucks, right? You know, I would go into a room and I'd, I'd open the door and I knew I was going to walk into somebody who wasn't feeling well because the shades were closed. They had a white, uh, you know, cool washcloth on their forehead because they were nauseous and vomiting and couldn't get up to do the therapy. And I look at that and I reflect back on that and say, you know what? We can do better. We can do better than what we're doing. You know, so when I go through this presentation, I want you to think about it as the roadmap, mm -hmm. right? This is, this is the action plan on how you can make it better. So here's my conflict of interest statement. That was up for a while, so we'll go past that. Um, learner outcomes, we're gonna talk about, you know, how you can take this information and, and place it in your practice setting. So the agenda, um, what I'm gonna share with you is the process, right? So you guys are gonna see a lot of multimodal pain management plans as you come through, you're gonna see it on the posters, you're gonna see it in presentations, and there's a lot of them out there. You know, but again, I want to show you the process of actual implementation. So we're going to talk about why it's important to look at implementing multimodal plans. We're going to talk about how to go about choosing that protocol for your facility. We're going to talk about how to get that buy-in from your key stakeholders. We're also going to talk about how to go to implementation and how to continue to monitor and improve your results. Also, at the end, I will be able to share with you the results, the outcomes that I was able to achieve through this implementation process. So before we begin, I want you to kind of take a moment and think about why you chose this particular course to attend and what you were looking to get out of it. Think about what in your practice setting specifically do you want to see change? So me going back to my story, I was, I was tired of the pain, I was tired of the nauseousness, and I just wanted to find a better process. So think about those specific things in your current practice setting that you're looking to improve. So why do we need a multimodal pain management plan? Well, have an opioid epidemic, right? We've been hearing that um, pretty consistently. You know, and in 2017, AARP wrote an article, America's Addiction to Pain Pills. And in that article, they outlined quite a few staggering statistics, right? The last two decades, the hospitalization rate in our um, 65 and older patients has quintupled. In 2015, a third of those Medicare patients which is about 12 million people were actually prescribed pain medications. Um, in 2016, there was 42,000 opioid deaths. Of those 42,000, 40% of those, or 46 people a day, were specific to um, prescribed pain medications. So in response to that, they, uh, the House and Senate created the Opioid Response Act, right? So what this act did is it came in and it provided programs for prevention, treatment, and recovery for opioid addicted people. You know, and that has now filtered down to the state levels, and I, I don't know that every state has it at this point, but some of you are already starting to see that, right? You have acute pain exceptions, and you have certain quantities that you were able to prescribe to your patients prior to discharge. So this really affects our delivery of care. It shows that what we've currently been doing is gonna have to change for us to stay up with this. So other reasons why you might want to look at multimodal is changes in our healthcare environment, right? Paper performance, you've got value-based care, you've got improved outcomes at lower costs. Um, bundles, if anybody opted into the BPCI advanced bundles, you know, last October, or any of those lucky handful that got the CGR mandatory bundle in 2016, you know that we have to improve the quality and the cost of the care that we're delivering. So, Make things a little bit more interesting. In 2018, you know, CMS, you know, took the uh, took total knees off the inpatient only list, making it a little bit more difficult to, to perform in those bundles. So I, I saw these other presenters talking about that, so I'll leave that to them. It's a whole nother ball of wax. So, <laughs> but what they basically did is they took our lower risk patients out of those bundles, you know, leaving us with those higher risk, more more, more morbid patients to to care for. Um, so again, that, that brings us back to reflecting on the why. Why are we here? Why are we doing this? You know, we need to improve the quality of care that we're doing. We can do better. And you know, honestly, our patients, they deserve better. So um, how do I choose a protocol? So we know we need to change, 
but how? And if we can choose those changes, you know, what what, what protocol do we pick? As I kind of alluded to before, you, you look at all these different places and what people are doing, and they're all different. <laughs> you know, so really it's looking at the research, gathering that information, and figuring out what is going to work for you, your facility, and your particular patient population. I mean, the basis is the same. You're looking at acetaminophen, an anti-inflammatory, a muscle relaxer, an anti-convulsant, some sort of analgesic, and something in place for post-op nausea and vomiting. So you're going to look at what kind of drugs that you have access to within your facility. You don't want to go have to pick a drug that you have to go to the committees to try to get access to and get them on your formulary at your hospital. You also want to take into consideration um, what drugs are covered by insurances, right? What are, what is your payer mix? Because you want to make sure that you have medications that are available to your patients and they can continue to take after they go home. So um, you want to work with the multidisciplinary team, okay? You, you're looking at like my biggest winner was my my anesthesia my anesthesiologist. Okay, you want you want your surgeons on board, but you also want it to touch base with anesthesia because they are seeing this in other specialties, right? They're seeing it in colorectal with their ERAS protocols. So they have a little bit longer track and a little bit more um, breadth of information for you to kind of help guide you through that. So you want to get everybody at the table and look at you know how you would, how what, what medications are best to implement. So making sure that you have that whole team approach. So once you figure out what you want to do and kind of the, the idea of what you want to implement, you need to get the buy-in. So who are your two key stakeholders? It's going to be your facility and it's going to be your surgeons. So when you're looking at facilities, they're looking at you know cost and they're looking at outcomes. So you want to look at any proposed new protocol, what kind of cost you may be incurring. Also looking at you know what current uh, practices and maybe some costs that you may be eliminating that can kind of defer some of those other costs. Um, so you want to show them the savings. So you take this to your, your uh, leadership team and one thing I've learned is narcotics are cheap. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh yeah, we're going to decrease narcotic use. But overall, as far as a cost aspect, they're cheap. So that is not really when you're looking at cost. It definitely benefits the patients. But it's not going to help you in that. So look at looking at some of your other uh, equipment and things that you're using. So for example, um, my facility we were using a continuous catheter, um, an indwelling catheter for a saphenous nerve block. Um, we went to a local infiltration that eliminated the cost of the catheter. It eliminated the cost of the kit to place the catheter, and it also eliminated staffing in the pre-op holding area to have that catheter placed with the anesthesia team. So there was some cost I was able to save there. Um, you want to look at your pre-data. So you want to have your baseline. If you're looking to improve costs, what are your current costs? If you're looking to improve length of stay, what is your current length of stay? So that way when you take this to your, your leadership team, you can show them the benefit of where you're at, what you think you can do, and where you're going to end up. Um, start small. Guys, don't try to boil the ocean. I know that we want to just spread it out and just help everybody. But the reality is, is that's a lot to take on. And it, it sometimes when we take on too much, we're, we're kind of doomed to fail. So start small. Let's start with a trial. We started with a 60 patient trial. Um, and we went with the total knees because, you know, they're low-hanging fruit. They have the most pain. You know, they have a little bit more pain than the kids do. So I thought we would be able to make the most um, benefit there. So you're going to take this information. You're going to take it to the leadership team. And when I'm talking about your leadership team, the people that you want in the room are going to be your departments, right? Your surgery, your um, pharmacy, finance, and your nursing leadership. And I always stress the fact of having somebody there that has a global view of what you're doing. Because a lot of times when you go to implement something, you may be taking a cost from one department and placing it on another. So again, going back to my, my, my catheter example, you know, that was coming out of surgery. Well, guess what? The, the infiltration is now coming out of pharmacy and pharmacy is like, wait, I don't want that cost. So you need to have somebody there with a global view that can say, no, 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 no. For our bundles and for what we're doing, this benefits everybody as a whole. You're going to need to incur that cost. So how to get your physician by? Well, um, physicians, they, uh, they are research-based, right? So taking the information that you've learned and bringing it 
to them and showing them what, what you found out and what, uh, what other facilities are doing. Um, at, their, at their core, they want what's best for their patients. So knowing your physicians and knowing how to approach your physicians. You know, you might have physicians that are partnered with facilities and they may care about costs. You may have physicians that are not partnered with the facilities and they may not want to hear about the cost savings and they want to hear about the benefits for their patients. So really honing in and focusing on that particular physician and how you're going to get that buy-in from them. Uh, find your partner. You might have multiple physicians and maybe not all of them want to join you. Maybe you can only find one. That is all you need. You only need one to say, you know what? I'm willing to try this because physicians are competitive by nature. So once they see what the outcomes that you're having and don't kid yourself, those floor nurses are telling them, hey, I don't know what you're doing, but Dr. So-and-so's patients do so much better than yours. Okay, they will, they will go out and they will tell their physicians that. Now they're looking around the room going, how do I do that? You know, we had one holdout physician. You know, I told you we had a trial of 60 patients. We got two weeks into the trial and he's like, now, okay, I, I want in on this, right? I, I, the nurses have given me a hard enough time. They want my patients to start using this. And I had to tell them, no, we're in the middle of the trial. You know, you gotta wait till the end of the trial before you can begin. And he was not happy with me. <laughs> <laughs> so once you've got all the buy-in and you've got what you're gonna do, now you gotta implement it. So again, bringing that multidisciplinary team back to the table is imperative to the success of your process. And at this point, I'm talking the entire patient care continuum. We're talking starting in the physician's office, in pre-admission testing, because some of those meds are going to affect what they're teaching your patients before they come in. Um, you've got your, your pre-op surgery, PACU, because again, those, those pre-op medications, um, what they're doing in surgery is probably going to change. Um, the nursing unit, physical therapy, uh, occupational therapy, case management, just making sure that everybody knows what the process is and what you're working on and what the goals are. Um, staff education, like I said, is key, especially the nursing units. You want that buy-in. You want them to understand what it is that we're working on so that way they can support you and you can be successful in the processes that you've put in place. Uh, patient education, that preoperative education class is key because it sets up the expectation for the patients. Here's what we're going to do to manage your pain. Here's what a reasonable pain expectation is, right? You know, and all the other stuff that goes through that preoperative class. And right now, if you have education materials, you know, your surgical guidebook, patient handouts that have specific criteria in it, saying, you know, post-op day one, post-op day two, post-op day three, you're going to want to remove those specifics because that is going to change when you implement a multimodal plan. Um, and I would even argue that you don't put any specifics about your multimodal plan in any of your education because even after you implement it, as you proceed forward, it might change as well. So just be very general in those terms and then you can teach to those specifics as they come through the class. Um, and don't forget about your post-acute partners. Guys, if you have a preferred provider network that you use for, for rehab and for home health, make sure that you are bringing them in and you are letting them know the changes in the protocols that are happening and what they should expect. You know, again, that's a piece that I missed. I, um, about a month into it, you know, I started getting phone calls and it was like, what are you doing? <laughs> what did you do to these patients? You know, so I had to bring them back to my hospital. I opened up the, the big conference room and I had about, um, 100 people in that room representing about 45 different organizations that we commonly refer to to be able to share that information with them and that was huge so they could truly be our partners with that so you get it up you get it running and it's great but just like any process if you don't monitor it it fails right so it's it's, it's a constant process of monitoring reviewing and improving the process you know, you get your process in place and know that with any new implementation or anything new that you start, there's going to be a downstream output change. So making sure that you've got somebody assigned to this. You know, is, this a, is it a, uh, a care coordinator? Is it a unit manager? Is it, you know, a project manager or whatever is appropriate for your facility? But just making sure that somebody is tied to monitoring the data, monitoring the output of what you put in place. Um, so to kind of give you some examples um, of, of the, the things that I learned is um, like med carts. <laughs> All the med carts have the appropriate meds in them, which is great. We checked that, but what we didn't do is check the car levels, <laughs> right? Because 
now we're going to increase the amount of those medications that we're, we're giving and know that you're going to look at on the nursing unit as well as pre-op surgery in PACU, right? So um, the other thing is uh, uh, discharge challenges. So it was great. Our patients were doing wonderful. It's like you flipped the light switch and they were brand new patients. And we decreased length of stay. Well, by decreasing length of stay, we also subsequently decreased uh, a day of discharge planning. So those patients couldn't get their walkers in time to go home. Now, I can send a three and one remote home, you know, to be delivered to their house, but they can't safely get into the, from their car into their home without their walkers. So that was something we really needed. So, you know, I slapped a Band-Aid on it. We bought a bunch of walkers and said, hey, we're going to let you borrow these, and then when you come to your follow-up appointment, just bring that walker with you. We're going to have the commode and the walker sent to your house. But we also worked on a long-term solution, which was working with physicians' offices to try to arrange that DME into the patient's hands prior to surgery, so that way they came in with their walker, and then our therapist would adjust it for them while they were there. Um, HCAPS challenges. So when we implemented the multimodal, we also removed the pulleys. So completely cold turkey on the pulleys at the time. Well, our staff responsiveness tanked. <laughs> because one, we didn't have enough three and one commodes in every room. And two, the nurses were not used to getting the patients up day of surgery right away when they arrived to the unit. So they weren't responding as quickly because they were not used to that process. So again, it was going back, ordering appropriate equipment, re-educating the staff, and within a month of doing that, you know, our, our staff responsiveness improved. Uh, some of our therapy challenges, so as I'm kind of alluding to, our patients were doing so much better, right? And they're not having any pain, and you don't realize how much pain actually limits their ability to do the therapy until you see it in action. You know, they're bending at about, you know, 80, 85. All of a sudden, now they're bending at 100 degrees post-op day one. Sounds wonderful, right? Yes, they're moving their knee. Not so wonderful in a post-surgical knee where you've got a bunch of blood and fluid and now we start leaking through that incision. So we had to stop range of motion. It only happened to a couple patients, but going back and re-educating the therapy staff, look, we don't want them at 100 degrees on post-op day one. That, that's a two week, month out goal. We want them hard to stop at 90. Let's just work on getting it back and keeping them moving. Um, assessments, so uh, we went from that continuous catheter to the local infiltration. Well, there is some surgeon technique involved in that. So there was a learning curve, and what happened is we were using a long-acting local infiltrate, and it got a little close to the saphenous nerve a couple of times. So we had a couple of foot drops. Now, those resolved within 24 hours, thank God. And <laughs> they, uh, but it only happened to two patients, because once we saw it happen, again, we had somebody monitoring that to go back to the surgeon and go, look, this is what's causing this. You know, same thing with every, all these other processes that I talked about. You know, because we were able to catch it so quickly because somebody was monitoring it, we were able to, to, to right the ship immediately. So, um, and also a side note that I told you we were doing a 60 patient trial. We got about 30 patients through and then went to full implementation. So that's when we were able to allow that other surgeon in um, and we were, did it on all fill joints. So then we were able to include our hips, partials, and our revisions at that point. So, a little bit of our outcomes. So, what I did is I went back and I did a retrospective analysis and I did a, a, a QI study. So, I wanted more than the 30 patients that were actual part of the trial. So, we did 80 intervention and 60, um, 60 that were with the old protocol. So, total cost savings in that group in those 80 was $118,000. Now, keep in mind that is my acute savings that did not include my post-acute savings for my bundle. So I did not include that, but I will tell you that our hospital system, we've got six campus with, uh, hospitals within our system that do orthopedics that are all under the state Medicare license, and our hospital has been the top performer all three years so far um, in that bundle. So length of stay, we were able to decrease by an entire day. Um, currently, right now, we're sitting at about 1.7 for our total needs. Pain goal met, so what we did is we took what their stated pain goal was prior to surgery and then compared it to their 8 a.m. pain assessment, the morning um, of therapy, the first um, morning. So that increased by 104%, where we were actually starting to meet those patients' stated goals. That um, post-op day one, I mean our product use. So looking at on post-op day one, so from midnight day of surgery to midnight the next day, so that entire 24 hour period, how much narcotics our patients were actually getting through the IV. 
and that decreased by 92%. And I think what the biggest impact for me on that was when a nurse actually came up to me um, during the trial phase and said, Rachel, I don't have to walk into the room with a vial of morphine to do my admissions anymore. You know, at that moment, it really hits you and it impacts you, the difference that you're making. On post-op day, post day one, I mean, we literally are using minimal amount of IV narcotics. Um, and you gotta include the post-op nausea vomiting piece, you know. If, if, from my experience, if a patient's in pain, they can kind of push through that. But if they're nauseous and they're vomiting, they're not getting out of that bed later. So that post-op nausea vomiting piece is huge. So we decreased that by 69%. And the way that we measured that is rescue med. So any sort of anti-emetic given from PACU through discharge, how many times did they get a rescue med? Um, and right now we're sitting at about 10% of our patients are actually receiving a rescue med. And I can tell you those are mild to moderate. So they're only getting one to two doses during that entire period of stay. So, that's a lot of information, guys. So we're gonna think about this, okay? Think about the information that you've heard today and what you can do based on that information. And think about something that you can do today, you know, and it doesn't have to be big. You know, it might just be, let's, let's start doing the research. You know, think about what you can probably accomplish in the next 90 days. You know, maybe you can set up some meetings and kind of get everybody to the table and start talking about it. <coughs> So that completes it. So guys, I really would like to thank you for your time and attention this morning um, and, and, and allowing me the opportunity to share this information with you because as you can probably hear in my voice, it's, it's in my heart. I think that um, we all have a real opportunity here to, to improve the care. Thank you. Right. So it's hard. 
Because again, it's, it's based on um, insurance. Is it the insurance that is? It's insurance. Well, we have a problem with going to our insurance because we really want to put all of our medications as well. Mm -hmm. We only need really two to three medications to help calm us and actually asking for a diagnosis now. I'm a little spoiled, I'll be honest. <laughs> we have an outpatient pharmacy within our facility. So that's how we get our, our medications to our patients because we are partnered with them, right? So they know what our physicians write. But that, that is true, and that was one of the things in our pre-op class that we, we would tell our patients, listen, fill them here because our pharmacists know what our physicians write and they know what's appropriate because if they do take them to another outside vendor, you run into those, those problem areas. And the only thing I would suggest, if I were in that situation, that I was having that difficulty, I would try to reach out to the community and find that partner that's near the hospital and see if you can start working with those pharmacists to, to, to fill those things appropriately for your patients, knowing that they come out every week. Yes, you're welcome. Any other questions? <laughs>